Erev Tov. You are watching a prophetic segment of Israeli News Live. This message here is very urgent. It is very important. It is going to be in depth and very much detail will be brought out to this evening as something that I feel that is very urgent that you be made aware of. And so therefore we are going into a prophetic segment of our news this evening. This news is actually as a result of an article that appeared on Arut Shiva, their uh, news program, IsraelNationalNews.com. You can look this article up, Nasrallah, excuse me, Nasrallah, who is the, um, he is a chief uh, Hamas terrorist uh, from, the, from Hezbollah in Lebanon. And he has gone on to state, as they uh, made it clear in this article from yesterday's report, where he was stating that they had weapons that Israel had no idea they could even imagine that they have. He states today that they are ready and prepared to take the Galilee. They are planning on fighting a war against Israel and taking the Galilee. Now, this amid another article on Israel National News uh, where they had, there were concerns that Israeli forces, they had m moved more of the Israeli forces out of the Golan, uh, out of the northern regions on the Lebanese border, and it, is, it has caused a 60% increase of weapons by private citizens expecting an invasion of the Lebanese troops. Um, I want to bring this to your mind and to your attention to really to get you to understand what's going on. Why would Israel be willing to weaken its border with the threat of war uh, against a, 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 an enemy, Hezbollah, that has 10 times more capability from their own estimates than that of Hamas? It certainly can't be because they're trusting in the Iron Dome. In fact, in another assessment, in fact, all, when I say these assessments, these news articles, we have reported on each one of these here on Israeli News Live. So I'm not taking the time to give you every detail where all these informations are found, but if you go back in our news history here in the last month, you will see these news articles that have been done. But uh, the, 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 excuse me, the Israeli government has already said in another statement that they did expect that there would be a conflict between Hezbollah and Israel in the near future and that they more than likely Hezbollah would be able to take all the way down to the Galilee, but Israel would be able to push them back within just a matter of two or three days. That was another article we reported on. Now we're dealing with another issue that we're looking at. When I read about this article today with Nasrallah, in his threat to take the Galilee, I realized then something struck my heart. This is going to be a reality. And it's going to be a reality because there is a plan in the process. And then I begin to realize, why then is there a coalition force fighting ISIS? Why was ISIS ever began in the first place? Now, I actually have friends in Israel. In fact, I was living in the Golan for a little while there. And while I was in the Golan, a former military uh, man that was there that served in the Israeli armed forces told me that ISIS, they have actually seen some of the ISIS people, the members, the head leaders of ISIS wearing uh, the tzitzit, the, the little, the little, tali, the little uh, tassels that come off of a prayer shawl. I found this hard to believe. And even he told me, I know it sounds crazy. He says, but there actually there are Jewish people that are in, in on that. Now, whether or not this is true or not, I don't know. I cannot say. I do know, though, that the Americans helped train some of the leaders that are part of that ISIS group. That has already been documented in other news sources. We've covered that as well, bringing out those news sources to you in the past, that they were trained by the, by the United States, and now they're terrorizing all the Middle East. Well, Interesting. Finally, it comes to a place where the United States has to go in and protect everybody, and they begin a bombing campaign. We've even covered those there. We've covered the bombing right there on the Syrian and Golan border. Well, you know, it's kind of interesting. Anytime the United States and its coalition forces ever intend to invade a country, they always start by a bombing campaign. But they never can really justify why they're doing it. They were trying to justify this back when they were dealing with Yasser, uh, uh, Basar Assad, when they're trying to overthrow his regime, when Obama was going to go in. But for some reason, everything backfired and nothing ever came together. So I guess they had to have more terror attacks to really make it look good, to make, it, make the, the allies realize that we've got a real problem on our hand. 
but it goes much deeper than that. Yes, what is it about though? It's about the oil. Well, there's another problem. Back in, um, uh, back on January 23rd of the, this past year, 2014, Yas, uh, excuse me, uh, Mahmoud Abbas goes to Russia to sign a billion dollar gas and natural oil deal with Russia, with the president, Vladimir Putin, and also with the prime minister there. This was, uh, they, and according to the TASS uh, news agency, they were planning on pumping 30 billion cubic meters of natural gas off the coast of, uh, the coast of Gaza. And, the, and the, very, the very gas company that would do it is a state-ran gas company for Russia. Uh, it says in one statement here, Russian President Vladimir Putin, who met with Abbas, said relations between Russia and Palestine are based on a very solid historical foundation, adding a lot needs to be done to develop the trade and economic relations between the two countries. That was reported in the Voice of Russia. Now, this is what really becomes interesting. Russia is an ally to Bashar Assad, who is the president of Syria. The United States are backing the, the, uh, the forces that are fighting to, to, to dethrone the president of Syria. And Russia also is allies with Iran. Now we're very, most people are very aware that are in biblical prophecy about the Gog and Magog war, where that, that bear of the north will come down to take the spoil down in Israel. And some people have said that the word spoil represents the oil, is what they will come for. But the Vatican has a different plan, and I'm sure they would say, not over my dead body. But let's go over to this part here. What is, it, what is in it for the Vatican? Why is the Vatican behind this? Because we know that the Vatican controls the United Nations. They have the influence. They reestablished the Roman Empire, the former Roman Empire, that is. They rebuilt that with the European Union. In fact, after the nine-month negotiations failed, the Obama administration's nine-month negotiations with John Kerry failed with the Palestinians, or apparently failed with the Palestinians, it was right after that that all the world leaders began to start announcing that Palestine, they recognize the Palestinian people as a state, a sovereign state. And even the United States was on the verge of declaring the very same thing and supportive of even forcing this of a unit with a United Nations vote. And then suddenly here at the end of this year or this past year, 2014, the United States too takes a turn on its stance concerning the Palestinian state. And now they are willing to block this possibility of happening. So the question is, what about the prophecy of Rebecca, where she has the two children fighting in her womb? Something we reported on ourselves before, right before, right when the negotiations were announced, and the Lord began to reveal to my own heart that this is a prophecy being fulfilled before our eyes. Even Pastor Begley on his own program asked me before the negotiations had ended, do you think that there will be two states when this is done? And I told him, I'm not a prophet. I cannot prophesy of this. But now I know that the fulfillment of Rebecca's prophecy was fulfilled at the conclusion of the negotiations. Because what was going on in the forefront was not what was happening in the background. I'm sure Giulio Meotti could tell you that as he has looked, and as Barry uh, Hamish could also tell you that. Both, uh, one, Barry Hamish is an Israeli journalist uh, that lives in the United States now for, this, for his own safety, and Giulio Miotti is an Italian journalist, but both of them are quite clear on what the Vatican's intents are. The Vatican just wants to control, control Jerusalem. It really doesn't need any of our money. They have the wealth of the world. In fact, they've already stated they wanted to control a one world bank, but they also want to control Israel. That is another issue that they're looking at. So basically what the Vatican has offered in exchange for getting what they want to the world community is to give them that natural gas, that oil reserves that are in Israel, not only in Israel, but also in Lebanon and Syria. And what better way but to put together a fake war in order to get the coalition forces in there to help Israel. This is why we've seen a change in the posture in the uh, administration of Prime Minister Netanyahu. 
Even he's taken a different stance as he has worked with the Vatican. Shimon Perez, who spearheaded this starting back in 1993, the Oslo Accords, where we find out later that the Vatican was the one that was behind all of this. It wasn't a two-state solution. It was the fact that the Vatican needed control because the Vatican wants the promised land. That's also why we see the Vatican always siding with the Palestinians, something that we clearly see in the book of Daniel, especially in chapter 11. Hmm, interesting, nonetheless. Let's take a look at this from a political stand, excuse me, from a spiritual standpoint here in just a second here. Let me first just bring to your attention another article. This article was by Guglielmo Miotti. This is back in 2011. It's, it's entitled, Expose, the Vatican wants to lay its hands on Jerusalem. So you don't just think that we're saying this. This was on Israel National News. Uh, and it says here, this just highlights of the article, peace negotiations in the Middle East must tackle the issue of status of the holy sites of Jerusalem. Cardinal uh, Jean-Louis Jean Toron, head of the Vatican's Council into Interreligious Dialogue, declared several days ago in Rome, the Vatican's former minister asked to place some Israeli holy places under Vatican authority alluding to the uh, cynical of Mount Zion and the Garden of Gethsemane at the foot of the Mount of Olives in Jerusalem. Now, anybody that knows anything, know, we have reported this over and over and over, they've already got it now. They have Mount Zion. It has been given to the Vatican, no referendum in Israel, no nothing. Amidst all of the outcry by the Orthodox community, there was still no one that stopped them. What did they do? They got it. They held a communion service on the Temple Mount. Excuse me, not the Temple Mount, but on the, uh, the Mount of, uh, of on Mount Zion over the tomb of David and as well inside the tomb of David. Whether the Jews liked it or not, special forces were brought in and they threw out the Jews from the tomb of David where they do their prayers at. And they held a communion service there and it has been going on weekly ever since. Now, why is this place so important? That's something you're going to be seeing on another video we're doing about the Star of David, or the Morgan David, as it's called. And by the way, don't be so quick to judge that just yet. You really need to see the documentary film that we're putting together for you about the Star of David. That also has been used against the Jewish people to incite violence and anti-Semitism against them, not knowing what really lays at Mount Zion, and who actually is covering up evidence regarding that, not just the Israelis, but the Vatican as well. Why? Because Mount Zion is also an archaeological site for one of the first churches by the brother James, the brother of Jesus, the brother of Yeshua. So it's one of the reasons why this site is so important as well. Now, bringing up uh, to this point right here, they're wanting this. Now let's look at some of the other comments in the article. The first site also houses what is referred to as King David's tomb in the article. There will not be peace. Notice this quotation. This is what Turan says. Now remember now, Turan, he is uh, the cardinal, Jean-Louis Turan, the head of the Vatican Council on Interreligious Dialogue. He states, there will not be peace if the question of the holy sites is not adequately resolved. Turin said. The part of Jerusalem within the walls with the holy sites of the three religions is humanity's heritage. The sacred and unique character of the area must be safeguarded and it can only be done with a special internationally guaranteed statute. That is some heavy rhetoric right there. There will not be peace. You see, the Vatican is doing the same thing that it did uh, what, 15, 1600 years ago, when it created the Islamic religion in order to kill off the early Jewish believers that believed that Yeshua was Messiah, and to also take and destroy all the writings that they had, all the documentation, everything that they possibly could, they wanted to stomp it out. And they did just that along with the help of the Islamic regime. Why? Because Haddad, who was one of uh, Esau's descendants had actually went and studied under Pharaoh's tutorage. He was the only survivor of the royal house of, of, of Esau. He leaves there, goes to Syria, becomes the king of Syria, and later the Jewish people trace his lineage as he goes from northern Africa into Rome. Later sets up there, clearly identified in the book of Obadiah, 
that God puts the, the children of Esau, the Edomites, as the Romans who came down and who were the not the physical warriors, but who were in agreement with the warriors they were using, which were Syrian warriors, to wage war against the Jews. This is what's happening all over again. The Vatican is good at it. They've always had a strong relationship with the Islamic people, and they use them to wage war against whomever they will, preferably any of those true believers in Yeshua as the Messiah, that is Jesus as Messiah, they will wage war there. And they always do it from a religious standpoint with also one hand over the militaries of the world. At this particular time, back when they first did this against the Jews there, they were killing all the Jews in Northern Africa, Israel, and the Middle East where they were gaining many, many converts. Why? Because it was a state-ran religion just as state, church and state are once again uniting worldwide. We are definitely, you can see this, the evidence of this in Europe, it's everywhere. You want to go in a bookstore in Europe, you'll see more Nazi books than you could ever even imagine. And right along with it, all the books about the Pope and the Vatican. That's kind of interesting that they're always on the bookshelves together. Okay, now... So he said there won't be peace, and this is exactly what we're seeing in the case of the Palestinians. Now, why is that? You know, Daniel speaks about how that this prince that shall come comes up strong with a small people. That's in Daniel chapter 11. That small people are the Palestinians. They've been using the Palestinians. So those Palestinians that may watch this, You've been a puppet in a pawn all along, just like Hezbollah is a puppet as well. Hezbollah has no idea. They're not really fighting a holy war. They're fighting a Vatican war, where the Vatican wants to get control of Jerusalem. And the Vatican's been using all the Arabic nations surrounding Israel to do just that. Why do you think the Vatican, before going to Israel this time, when Pope Francis went to visit uh, Israel, goes to the Jordanians to begin with? because the Jordanians were giving a little bit of autonomy over the Temple Mount. So therefore, they're building their partnership, planning to build a third temple. Actually, it's not going to be a third temple like Solomon's temple. It's going to be a temple for the Vatican, which I will show you just momentarily. Before I do, though, let me read you a few more things here written in this article by Giulio Miotti. This is back in 2011. The Vatican's former archbishop in Jerusalem, Michael Sabah, just promoted an appeal to the European Union and the United States to stop the hybridization of Jerusalem. Two weeks ago, messenger uh, David Marie uh, Jaeger, who was recently appointed by Pope, Pope Benedict XVI to the Vatican's highest court, talked to Washington about a current U.S. Supreme Court case over whether an American boy born in Jerusalem should add Israel after the name of the historic city on his U.S. passport. Jaeger said the question about Jerusalem is not whether it is the capital of Israel, it is the question whether it is part of a national territory. They're wanting to bring about a millennium without having a true Messiah. They have to manufacture one. But don't think that there's going to be a Mahadi. I'm sure they'll bring about a fake Mahadi to make themselves look good. They're always trying to be, bring someone that detracts attention off of themselves. This is why the, the Vatican created the Islamic religion, not just to wage war against the Jews and to kill off all the Jews that they possibly could that were believing that Yeshua was indeed the Messiah, which the Orthodox Jewish community was all for at the time too because they had been blinded by God not to be able to recognize what the truth was while God went through the world saving the Gentile peoples while they could be saved. So what did they do? They went, they killed the Jews in Northern Africa, Syria, all those places in there. That is true. So, the, But the whole purpose of this is, is they want to gain control. And they wrote in their own writing as well in, in the Quran, because you have to remember, Muhammad, he could not write anything. He was an ignorant prophet, or prophet for them, that couldn't write anything. He married Kaji, who was a devout Catholic girl. And she said he became demon-possessed later in his life. Nonetheless, the monks in northern Africa wrote their very wrote the Bible known as the Quran that the Muslim people believe today. Very sad to say, they're also children of Abraham, but yet they believe in nonsense, something that was never meant to be inspired word of God whatsoever. In fact, it's not an inspired book. It is a Vatican forgery. And unfortunately, the Islamic people believe it.
nonetheless. That's why you see that they use rosary beads. That's why you see the Islamic women dressed just like nuns do. I wonder if the Islamic people, the Muslim people, or the Arabic people around the world, have you ever considered that you and the Vatican are much like twins? No wonder Haddad actually had a strong relationship with you, one of Esau's descendants. You still kept him gladly. Uh, let me bring out one more point here in this article by Giulio Miotti. The Vatican wants Israel relinquishing sovereignty at the Western Wall and the Temple Mount. The Holy See uses the expression Holy Basin, which refers to the area of the Temple Mount, the Mount of Olives, Mount Zion, the variety of Christian holy sites, which the administration, former U.S. President Bill Clinton, began recommending be administered under a special regime. So see, this has already been going on for quite some time. In fact, all the way back to 1993, this has been going on. When Shimon Perez, the son of Ahab, as I call him, who was a descendant. Remember, Ahab, as bad as he was, he still repented in sackcloth and ashes. And when he did, God had the prophet Elijah to go back and tell him, he won't bring all this evil upon him, but upon his son. And Shimon Perez has been fulfilling the very destiny of Ahab's son. All right, so, um, as I told you over in Daniel, we already shared with you how that uh, the prince that shall come comes up strong with a small people. Let's notice some other things in verse 37 of chapter 11. Neither shall he regard uh, uh, the, the God of his fathers, nor the desire of women. And by the way, that desire in the Hebrew language is a beloved. In other words, it is a, it is a passion for women. He won't have a passion for women. Very obvious, the Catholic Church and all their bishops and all their cardinals and all their popes have no desire for women. They take a vow of chastity, and so therefore they don't go with the desire of women. And unfortunately, in many news cases around the world, their desire seems to be more for little boys. Now, that's just flat, but you have to tell it like it is. If you, you know, it's funny, you believe that Peter to be your first pope, and sadly enough, you seem to fail to recognize that he was married. Jesus goes to pray for Peter's mother-in-law. Now, what would you want a mother-in-law for unless you're married? So it's totally contrary to what you really teach. I think the first pope for the Rome was Judas Iscariot. That's who it really was. Let's move on down, though. Let's go to verse 39. Thus shall he do in the most... Let me, let me go ahead and read it all. Verse 38. And in his estate shall be... Uh, shall he honor the God of forces, and a God whom his fathers knew not shall he honor with gold, silver, and with precious stones and pleasant things. Those of you that are looking for the star of Molech, all you have to do is look at the sun god inside the Vatican and all their churches all over Europe, all over the world, all around the world, period, to see who really serves the star of Molech. And he says that they will honor the, uh, a God whom his fathers knew not. Hmm. Interesting, isn't it? Why his fathers knew not. Who are his fathers? Esau is where they're descended from. Esau was a son of Abraham, and his father did not know the gods that the Vatican serves today. And they do bow down before their stars. They do bow down before their statues of Mary and pray. They do make obeisance to all of their gods. But you don't see Israel bowing down to the star of David on their flag. Thus shall he do in the most strongholds with a strange God whom he shall acknowledge and increase with glory, and he shall cause them to rule over many and shall divide the land for gain. Interesting. The land being divided. Now, we say that the land was not divided. Let me share one other scripture with you. That's in Joel. That's what most people look to for, for the dividing of Israel. That, that, it was, that it's wrong to divide Israel, is in Joel chapter 3. I believe that's right where that's at. Joel, uh, or is it Joel chapter 2? But anyway, I know it's in Joel where it says that they will come and they will divide the land for gain. The Lord shall roar out of Mount Zion... Um, Uh, here we go. It's in verse uh, 2, chapter 3, verse 2. I will also gather all nations and will bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat and will plead with them there for my people and for my heritage Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations and parted my land. 
You know, when God comes down to deal with this issue here, it's too late. Time's up. But it's also what we're seeing happening right now. God is gathering the nations there. Now let's go back to Daniel real quick because I want to bring out a point here. Verse 44. Uh, it says here, But tidings out of the east and out of the north shall trouble him. Therefore he shall go forth with great fury to destroy and utterly to make away many. This is, this is what Rome is going to do. But how does Rome do it? What military force does Rome have? They have the United Nations. They have the European Union. They have the United States. This is why you see the coalition striking Syria with their bombs, their bombing campaign. This is why they raise up strife in countries that there really was not a strife to begin with. Why these, these people were trained in, in Jordanian territory by the United States to bring about unrest. They had to create a problem in order to solve it, in order to justify what they're going to do. But he says, he, he, because why? The tidings that, that will come out of the east and out of the north. Well, out of the north, the tidings were is that Russia signs a deal with the Palestinians, the ones that they came up strong with. And no matter how much the Palestinians think that they're going to have a state, this argument never was anything to do with the Palestinians. They were only the puppet or the pawn in the chess game. You see, the prophecy that Rebecca shares that God says to her, there's two nations in your womb, two manners of people, and when they come forth, they will be separated. What two nations was he speaking about? Esau and Jacob. This nine-month negotiation was only a front with the Palestinians. The real negotiation was between Rome and Israel. Rome is Esau, not the Palestinians. So at the end, end of the nine-month negotiation, there were two states. And guess what? The Vatican got Mount Zion to prove that it was a done deal. That's how serious we are in the hour we're in now. And I've got to take you to another scripture yet because you, there's one, the scripture of the two-state solution has been fulfilled. The two nations. Those two nations. The, the, it's, remember though, the pretense is to make the Palestinians look like they're a state. That's only a surface thing. The agreement, though, really is with Esau and Jacob. Esau being Rome. Rome got what they asked for. But that still, though, the Palestinian, the ones that he comes up strong with, that small people that he come up strong with, according to Daniel's prophecy in chapter 11, it still has to be a part of the fulfillment. That's why there was a nine-month negotiation. But even they still are playing a part in the whole scheme of things. And that's going to be found in Ezekiel chapter 35. Before we go there, let me read to you verse 45 in Daniel 11, uh, verse 45. And he shall plant the tabernacle of his palace between the seas in the glorious holy mountain. Yet, shall, uh, yet he shall come to his end and more shall help him. So there's going to be a quote-unquote third temple but it's not Solomon's temple it's the Vatican building what he will build his palace see Satan said in another passage there he wanted to be like God sit in the temple of God worshiped as if he were God and he won't be satisfied until he's got it there in Jerusalem this is why he was able to get that land. The land was divided right there in Jerusalem. What Guglielmo Mialti reported on was fulfilled. But the thing is, though, they're not done yet because he's more greedy than that. You see, the Vatican wants all of it because he's also got to make sure that those, that, those of his military force will have plenty of oil and natural gas for the years to come. And remember, the tidings out of the east and out of the north are troubling him. So he must go and make war with many. So they've stirred up Hezbollah against Israel. They've stirred up their little rat that's been in his hole. They've stirred him up in order to get him to fight, to invade the, the northern border of Israel. They will bring it upon the Jewish people. And the sad thing is, the Jewish people in Israel are not even aware of what's taking place. You're not even aware that your own political leaders have signed a covenant with Rome. And they have, they have fell for Rome's lies. This is also, we, we will, you will see, there will be a 
there, there, there are many, already many um, Orthodox rabbis that are standing with Rome. We find this also in John Hagee's confession that he made publicly before the world when he went and apologized for ever speaking against the Vatican and calling it the whore, the great whore of revelation written in the Christian Bible, which they are the great whore, no doubt. But in his own public confession, he states, I now better understand that this was for the greater good. The relationship between Rome and Israel I was unaware of. Very sad to say that Mr. Hagee actually sold out his own birthright. What for? Was it fear? Or does he really think? Does he, was he doing as John did in the book of Revelation when he looked at this great woman and wondered with great admiration for her? The angel said, why do you wonder? Let me show you who she really is. That's what we're trying to do, is show you who Rome really is. It is the great whore of revelation that the Christians write about in the Christian Bible. And I am a supporter of those true believing Christians that stand for Yeshua that stood for Israel, not those that are anti-Semitic, that have turned against Israel, that are the replacement theologist. And by the way, this is why Moshe Faglin got railroaded not too long ago himself. He was railroaded, why? Because he was a hindrance to the process. You see, there are true Jews in the Promised Land. When they decided to build this nation, Israel, now some people say, well, this is only done by the Rothschilds and the Illuminati. It's not just the Rothschilds and the Illuminati. You see, God can bring good out of something that looks evil. God made the Pharaoh of Egypt bow down to the Jews and, and give them all the gold and everything they had need of in order to create themselves a future state of Israel. Although it took 40 years to get there, it still was God's plan all along. Using the Egyptians and the wealth that they had gained, only as Israel was going through all the hardship and hard time, but it was used for their own good in the future. It's the same thing with the state of Israel. Yes, I know for a fact because of a good friend of mine that actually his father was there back in 1948 and they were fighting for their independence. How that before 1948, the British only limited certain amount of Jews to come in. Why? Because the Vatican was preparing what Jews had become faithful to them and allowed them in. So they could do what? They could get control of the political situation when they waged war against the Arabs in that area. And everything seemed to look good. But the friend that I know that was a part of that war, that was actually beginning when the, when the, when the uh, War of Independence was beginning to, to rise up. Tuvia Bielski was a part of that. And he saw firsthand there were certain families gaining to get power over this new state that was going to be born and they were willing to kill other Jews in order to make that happen. That is a quote that I have personally for myself that I know of. But he refused to be any part of it. God bless Tuvia Bielski for speaking against it. And he said, I'll have no part of killing my own people when I spent the last six years of my life trying to save as many Jews as I could. And he saved, he saved thousands of Jews. The descendants, that is. 1,200 in all were how many Jews he saved during the Holocaust of Belarus, Belarusian Jews. And he came to the promised land. Now, I write about that in the book, Yom Suf, Israel's Final Exodus, if you want to read the story about that. But the point that I'm trying to bring to you now, though, is this here. What is going on now? The, the evil behind that, they, they got the state started, but then when, they, when the state came open for more Jews to come after the Holocaust, then the true Jews that God had intended to bring from the house of Judah back in to fulfill Zechariah 12's prophecy, as the true Jews began to come in there, even they began, some of them, to rise up into the ranks of the politics, and it became a problem for Rome. This is why Rome had to find a new way, because then they ended up getting some of the prime ministers that were not for Rome's agenda. So they came up strong with the small people. This is when they created the Palestinians something that never existed beforehand. Ask Gershon Solomon, he'll let you know. That was nothing but a fake thing that was done. After 1967 War of Independence, 
Moshe, Diane gave back the Temple Mount. See, God is going to come and deliver his people, and he's coming very soon. Now, to conclude for you here, let me take you to Ezekiel 35. As I said, Rebekah's prophecy is already fulfilled. We have two states. The Palestinians have been recognized as a front state already. The world recognized it. Now the little backtracking, because why? Rome, according to Daniel 11, is very nervous because they hear the plans of what the north, the people of the north are going to do. They know there's a Gog and Magog war coming, and they know that Russia is coming for the oil, and they know that Russia signed a contract with the Israelis, or excuse me, with the Palestinians, and they can't let this happen. They can't allow that to happen because the coalition won't fight for them. The coalition won't give them what they want, which is Jerusalem unless they get what they have need of as well. You see, it's a partnership right now. So he's frantic, and now he's going to kill as many as he possibly can. And many honest, true, godly, beautiful, lovely Jewish people will die as a result of this horrendous scheme that they've got going on. Let me show you, though, the prophecy in Ezekiel chapter 35 so you know what I'm speaking about. To save time, let's go down to verse 7. Thus will I make Mount Seir most desolate, let me back up. Let me, let me go to verse 5. Because thou hast had, had a, a perpetual hatred and hast hurled the children of Israel to the power of the sword in the time of their calamity, in the time of their final punishment, therefore as I live, says the Lord God, I will prepare thee to blood, and blood shall pursue thee. What is this? The Vatican has always been silent and has been an advocate of the persecution of the Jews through their entire history as an institution. Even Pope Pius XII, Guglielm Mioti will clearly bring it out in his own writings, in his own investigative report, as well as Barry Chumash and many others, that they were he was nothing but a bloodthirsty, wanted power, and used the Nazi uh, machine to do so and was hoping to take Israel even back then, but the plans didn't work out just yet. So anyway, God is angry with them and says that there. Jumping down now, we'll go ahead and go to verse 9. I will make thee, per uh, thee perpetual desolations, and thy cities shall not have restoration. And you shall know that I am the Lord. Now see, God intentionally says, your cities will not have restoration. Why? Because Israel... Even Jesus, when he sat on the Mount of Olives, said, O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often I would have hovered you as a hen with her own brood, but you would not. Your house is left to you desolate until you say, Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. It was a space of time. The prophecy over in Hosea chapter 5 clearly shows that, uh, uh, yeah, chapter 5, I believe, in chapter 5 and chapter 6, end of chapter 5 and beginning in chapter 6, that Israel would be restored on the third day. Many prophecies that Israel would be restored and that what was once called desolate shall be built again. Amos as well, the prophet Amos. All right, but this, they will not have theirs built. Now watch what he says. Verse 10, And you shall know that I am the Lord, because thou hast said, These two nations and these two countries shall be mine, and we will possess it, though the Lord was there. You see the greed? Just like it is over in Daniel chapter 11. He gets nervous about what's happening with that king of the north and the, and the, and the, and the, and the words from the east. He gets nervous. So he goes to make a lot of war. He has to take everything then. He created the Palestinian people so he could get him a state there. Why do you think you've had boundaries drawn for a Palestinian state that's on the maps all over the world? It's always been a ploy. You just don't see what's going on in the background, but I trust this, this news segment, this prophetic news segment will help you to understand this better. All right. So God says there that, they, that these two nations and these two countries shall be mine. That's what... That's what they're saying. Though the Lord was there, therefore, as I live, says the Lord God, I will do according to thy anger and according to thy envy, which thou hast used of, my, of thy hatred against them. And I will make myself known among them when I shall judge thee. And thou shalt know that I am the Lord, and that I have heard all thy blasphemies, which thou hast spoken against the mountains of Israel, saying, They are laid desolate, they are given us to consume. A lot of people are going to die in Israel as a result of these wars. And this is when he's going to try to take the land. This will be when God finally has to intervene. 
Thus with your mouth you have boasted against me and have multiplied your words against me. I have heard them, just like the Pharaoh of Rome. You've got to remember, what is the Vatican really to begin with? They're Egyptians. Because Hadad was trained under the Egyptian Pharaoh and brought all of his gods, the sun god included there, the god of Molech he brought with him. And they serve it in the Vatican and all over the world in their little churches. Well, big churches. Thus says the Lord God, when the whole earth rejoices, I will make thee desolate, and thou didst rejoice in, at the inheritance of the house of Israel, because it was desolate. And yes, they did rejoice. That's why they have the monument in Rome that stands there to this day, and it is called the Ark of Titus, and it is a rejoicing of the destruction of Israel, the temple, and they're bringing back the temple treasures. So yes, that's when they just did it. And he says... Because it was desolate, so will I do to thee, and thou shalt be desolate, O Mount Seir, and all Edom, the Edomites, the children of Esau. So now, in one last place I need to take you is to Micah. I want to share with you. And now remember too, Joel chapter 3 verse 2, I will gather all nations and, will get and, and, and bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat and I will plead with them there and my people and for my heritage Israel who they have scattered among the nations and parted my land. Now see, I can't say that that's the Gog and Magog war there. That may be Armageddon. I'm not sure on that. But the point is, still, God is going to still bring all the nations down to Israel. But will that be when the Gog and Magog war begins? I'm not sure. Micah chapter 4, let me bring this into you real quick, verse 6, And that day saith the Lord, will I assemble her that halteth driven, that is driven out, and her that I have afflicted. I will make her that halteth a remnant, and her that was cast far off a strong nation, and the Lord shall reign over them in Mount Zion from henceforth even forevermore. And thou, o tower of the flock, the stronghold of the daughter of Zion, and to thee shall it come, even the first dominion, the kingdom shall come to the daughter of Jerusalem. Now, keep that in mind. The daughter, that future generation that's going to be brought back to Israel, a remnant. Not everyone there in Israel is considered Jewish in the sight of God. Yes, by blood, yes, maybe so. But there is a remnant that he comes for, and he brings them back. And they're, they're back in their homeland forevermore, he says, on Mount Zion, in fact. But watch what he says next in verse 9. Now why dost thou cry out aloud? Is there no king in thee? Is thy counselor perished? For pains have taken thee as a woman in travail. So when Israel comes back, it's not all just peace and joy and happiness and glory. Hallelujah. It come, they come back and they've got to deal with problems. Pains as a woman in travail. That's what's about to happen. Yes, there will be an invasion from the north by Hezbollah. Yes, they will lose that land. Yes, they will bring a coalition in. This is how they're going to bring in the forces to help Israel to fight off because it'll be a horrible bloodbath. All been set up the entire time. The Vatican, they've been conspiring. They've been working on this all along. Oh my gosh. So he says, where is your king? Because Israel always wanted a king. That's what they wanted with when, when, when they, had, uh, they wanted uh, Saul to lead them into battle, they wanted to be like the rest of the world. They didn't want uh, Samuel the prophet. So he said, we want a king to lead us into battle. So God asked them the question, where is your king? Now we're being beat half to death. Where is your king that will deliver you? See, God knew that a king would turn against Israel in the future. We should have learned it from Ahab. Ahab married Jezebel. And so Shimon Perez married Jezebel and brought idolatry back in Israel. Wake up, people. This is an hour so much later than you realize. Do you realize that the, 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 the division has already taken place? It's already. The division was not so much about the two states. It's only in pretense. That's why God calls it two nations, because the Palestinians are the pawn. As mentioned in Daniel chapter 11, they're those people, the small people they come up strong with. But this is not what it was about. The dividing of the land was they wanted Mount Zion, and God clearly makes it clear that that's what he wanted was Mount Zion. And he takes it, and he said he's going to build his own palace in the midst of it there. And God will destroy it. Where they're in the midst of what? They're going to come right up there on the Temple Mount and build themselves a little makeshift. Uh, in the midst, I have, I have a feeling they're going to build it right between the Dome of the Rock and perhaps not on the side everybody thought. I think they may end up building it right there between the Dome of the Rock and what they call the... Uh, the Al-Aqsa Mosque. 
Wouldn't that be interesting? Wouldn't that be interesting if that's where they build it? Or will they end up building it as this new thing that's going around now that the temple really was not there? It was over here on Mount Zion is where the temple really stood, that they just tore the mountain down. I know, I know Mr. Klein that made the documentary. He contacted me originally when he was making this documentary to get my input on it. I knew that it was not of God. It looks good, though. But why would they suggest there? It's the Vatican's backup plan. In the, in the event that they can't build that temple on the Temple Mount, the Vatican owns that property where they have their little, their little Catholic church down there that people go down there and they can see where Jesus walked up the steps to Caiaphas' house. That's where they're talking about where it could be built and would settle all the issues. That's the Vatican's backup plan, by the way. And maybe that's the midst. Who knows? They got to get the Jews to believe it. Well, they got enough rabbinical Jews that are standing with the Vatican now to believe it anyway, I'm sure. So what does he say here? Um, he says here, For now shalt thou go forth out of the city, and thou shalt dwell in the field, and thou shalt go even into Babylon. There shalt thou be delivered. There the Lord shall redeem thee from the hand of thine enemy. Because Israel always wanted to be delivered from Rome. Yes, yeah, so you end up going back to Rome and bringing Jezebel right back into the country. And yes, the Jews will end up being kicked out of Jerusalem, and they'll dwell in the fields. Now also many nations are gathered against thee that say, Let her be defiled, and let our eye look upon Zion. But they know not the thoughts of the Lord, neither understand they his counsel, for he shall gather them as the sheaves unto the floor. Arise and thresh, O daughter of Zion. So you will be defeated. God will raise up. Now, you don't think that the Vatican hasn't been planning? Let me take you to the scripture that so many Christians look at, and you call it the, the, the Psalm 83 war. Psalm 83 war was only the, the plans that they were making about the Gog and Magog war. That's, or the war let, me, let, me, no, let, me, let me rephrase that. The Psalm 83 war is the, the, the fake war that they bring about to force the Jews to concede to this agreement that they're going to do. And they're using the Arabic nations to come against Israel to bring about this plan. And Psalm 83, though, because remember... They got all kinds of issues that they're dealing with. Keep thou not silence, O God. Hold not thy peace, and be not still, O God. For lo, thine enemies make a tumult, and they hate. They that hate thee have lifted up the head. In other words, they've raised up their leader. Okay, they have taken crafty counsel against thy people. You know, in Hebrew, they're they're, they're having council meetings, is what it is. It's official council meetings. They're doing it sneakily against the people of Israel. Why? They keep out. Why do you think Mr. Netanyahu kept out uh, Moshe Faglin, they kept out the observers on this last election? They can't take a chance of having someone else get in there and the political thing unravel and Moshe Faglin make him prime minister. They can't have that happen because their agenda requires that they have a Vatican insider. They have said, come and let us cut them off. I'm sorry, I didn't finish verse 3. They have taken crafty counsel against thy people and consulted against thy hidden ones. The hidden ones are the two witnesses. They've consulted against them. And, and, and let me just share something with you, just, just so you're aware of this. And I don't know if you are aware. Let me share this with you, and we're going to stop right here. Uh, I know I may, I may have to take you also. I want to take you to the Christian Bible and also show you another thing real quick in Revelation. Um, in just a moment here, uh, I think it's Revelation 7. I, I forget exactly. Let me, let me first take you to Psalm 83. I'm, st I'm still, I, I want to take you into the Hebrew part of this real quick because uh, it's very important that you see this here. Psalm 83, um, verse 3 right here. Okay. Uma shenecha. All right. What is that right there? When it says they've consulted, uh, wait, I'm sorry. I'm in, the, I'm in the wrong verse. I apologize. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Uh, the the uh, sufanecha, excuse me, the hidden ones. These are your two witnesses. Even as it says delivers would come and deliver them on Mount Zion. That verse there, do you realize that that verse there is the one place where it actually uses uh, Messiah in a plural in Hebrew? Moshiach, we'd say singular, Moshiachim in the plural. God is going to deliver them on Mount Zion where he sends the two witnesses. Now, the, Rome knows this and they don't know how to deal with this because they do know. Why? Wow, they got people like John Hagee on board now. 
letting them know. What are you going to do about the two witnesses when they come? So they consulted. They've made it, they, they, they decided, they've made a plan. What are we going to do about it? Well, so we, we're here to report to you today. The two-state solution is already a done deal. It's been done. It's been done. But now what you're doing, now what you're dealing with is Ezekiel 35, where they're going to say, we'll take these two nations. They'll say that this, that, that, that it's laid spoil. And while it's, while it's like that, they're going to just take it. See, what do you say? Um, these two nations and these two countries shall be mine, and we will possess it. Though the Lord was there, therefore, as I live, saith the Lord, uh, I will, uh, you know, he's going to do according to that. Uh, another place, I forget exactly where I read that to you, though, just a little bit ago, that they, that they will take it. They're going to take it while they can. This is the hour in their mind. This is the hour that we can take it and we can bring about. They're trying to bring about a millennium without it being that time. Okay, let me take you. I said I'd take you to Revelation real quick. The two witnesses. Um, Revelation chapter 11. My mind was a little bit blank on that to start with there. And, and in Revelation 11, this is where... And there was given me a reed likened to a rod, and the angel stood saying, Rise and measure the temple of God, and the altar, and them that worship therein. But the court which is without the temple, leave out, and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. You see, they, the thing is, they leave out that outer court. It's given to the Gentiles. And I will give power unto my two witnesses. And they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. Israel gave away that outer court to the Gentiles. It was already given away. Mount Zion was given away. The measuring is the preparation and the plans. The only thing that we still yet to see fulfilled in Revelation 11 are the two witnesses step on the scene. And it's got to be only a matter of time. And no doubt, God will bring that deliverance. Because he said deliverance on Mount Zion, the deliverers. Didn't quote that scripture to you. Just by paraphrasing. But he's got to send that. When? When all this turmoil takes place. I'm Stephen Benjamin with Israeli News Live.